Okay, getting started here. Um, let's do some more hypothesis, or some more sampling distribution stuff. Confidence intervals are an extremely important way that we evaluate our hypotheses, that we evaluate what's actually going on in the world. And in fact, uh, there are a lot of people who suggest that we should get rid of most of formal hypothesis testing. Um, not everybody. A lot of people still think it's very useful. Uh, so I'm going to teach you a little bit about hypothesis testing, and we're going to be stuck with that for this semester. Uh, we're going to do a lot of things that are involving formal hypothesis testing. Hypothesis testing, we're prepared for it because we know what a sampling distribution is. Now we've done uh, something a little different so far. We know what a confidence interval is. A confidence interval is our best guess about where the population mean is. Our, our sample um, point estimate, the, our sample mean, is our best guess, but a confidence interval tells us how much confidence we can have in that guess. And so it's a measure of the estimated precision of measurement of our sample mean. So if we've got our sample mean there and our confidence interval, that's, that's our, our best guess about where the mean probably is with a certain level of confidence, like 95% confidence or something. Like I said, confidence is a fuzzy, fudgy concept that doesn't translate into probability or odds or anything like that or certainty well it's just confidence and so that's why we can say that kind of thing so um, the values inside the confidence interval think of it this way those are the values that as far as we know might be the true population mean with a certain level of confidence I'm 95 percent confident that the true population mean is somewhere in there so any value in there might actually be the mean like 95 percent confidence the mean is in that range and values outside the confidence interval, our best guess is that they are probably not the population mean. So a lot of this is us just looking for the population mean. We want to know what the true average of this or that is. And that's a lot of important research that's out there. Now we can have a new use for confidence intervals. Excuse me, I'm yawning. Um, a new use for confidence intervals that we haven't encountered so far is one of its more common uses. We can evaluate the plausibility of any suggested or hypothesized population means. So we can say um, there's a hypothesis that the population mean should be, you know, that green star there. Is that believable? So we do a sample, we, we collect a sample and we do a confidence interval and it's inside the confidence interval that that particular value is that this theory that says that the mean should be there. Well, yeah, that's plausible. So we've supported that theory that said that the mean should be there. But if there was a theory that said the mean should be there, we have not supported that. We've actually caused um, some lack of support. So now we doubt that theory to some extent because we did this study and our confidence interval did not include this hypothesized value. So null hypothesis testing is taking this to a little bit more uh, complex level. We have a sample mean and we, s and we specify a null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is sort of a devil's advocate position, something we don't think is true and but is believable. So it's the second place alternative. It's it's a believable alternative and we um compare our hypothesis, the one that we think is actually going on, our hypothesis uh, is compared to the null hypothesis, and we let the data decide which one has the most support. So the null hypothesis has a population mean, and the hypothesis has a sub-zero. Sometimes we say H naught, N-A-U-G-H-T, not meaning nothing. So the null hypothesis, null meaning nothing. And we can say mu naught, or the mean of the null hypothesis. So the null hypothesis is usually specified as a distribution in this type of problem. We say the null hypothesis says that values should be distributed like this, and therefore the mean of those values should be such and such. So it's the way the world should look if we are wrong. So it's a sampling distribution of means. The null hypothesis has a regular distribution associated with it, of course, but we're always evaluating means, and so we always go straight to the sampling distribution of means for the null hypothesis. So when we draw little bell curves and label one, mu zero, etc., we're almost always labeling a sampling distribution of means unless otherwise specified. Nobody really believes in the null hypothesis. Researchers don't think it's true, but it must be accounted for. It's something that we say, we at least have to rule this out before we can believe in our, in our particular hypothesis or theory. So in this particular case, the mean for the null hypothesis is outside our confidence interval. So we would say, we reject the null hypothesis. We don't think this is what the world looks like. We think the world looks like this. 
like what this sample mean or what our hypothesis tells us. So when we test the null hypothesis, the logic goes like this. We do a counterfactual. We imagine something being true that we don't know if it's true or not. As far as we know, it's not true. We say, if the null hypothesis were true, how likely, that's a probability, how likely is it that we would observe in our sample, in our data collection, through random sampling, how likely is it that we would see our data, our mean, or something more extreme, meaning further away from the null hypothesis. You start with the null hypothesis and you go away. You go start with the mean and you go away. So if this was the distribution, and it goes from infinity to infinity, so anything can happen, if this was the distribution of how these values really are in the world that we can't see, how likely is it that we would get this sample? Well, that's a really important question. So if the mean of the null hypothesis is in the confidence interval we calculate, then the null hypothesis is quite plausible. Then we say it's actually kind of it's actually fairly likely if the mean is in here. It's it's fairly likely that we would observe that even with random sampling, even if the um, null hypothesis is true, we we could still see our results. So you might say to yourself, so um, I think the average IQ of UTPA students is is the national average or Let's say I think UTPA students are less intelligent than the national average, or something, to take a terrible example. Then we do a sample, and the national average is here, the UTPA average is here. Well, the national average is within this. Like It's very believable that because of random sampling, we just kind of got a random sample that was a little below average. But if the mean of the null hypothesis is not contained in the confidence interval, then the null hypothesis itself is not a plausible reason why we might have gotten our sample in the first place. So let's take a different variable. Let's say um, we assume that UTPA students are less violent than average, and we have some violence scale. And this is the average of UTPA students, but this is the national average of violence. Well, we have evidence that suggests that that might be true. We're not 100% sure. We're never 100% sure of anything. But it's not very plausible that, the, that this sample came from this distribution, that this mean came from this distribution of means. That's not plausible because the null hypothesis mean is not contained within our confidence interval. That's another way of saying our sample mean is far away from the null hypothesis mean. Therefore, we think our sample mean came from another population, not the population of people who have average violence, but people who have less than average violence. So getting formal, it's basic science. Hypothesis testing is one implementation of the basic scientific process. So you take your preferred hypothesis. You think this thing is what's going on. You think you understand the world, and you need to do a test to prove people how smart you are and how wrong they are. And you call it HA or H1. I flip-flop back and forth, different textbooks. Sometimes you just write the name H, Bob, like Bob's hypothesis. It, the subset script just tells you what's going on. Um, and you think, and you pit your hypothesis against a different hypothesis that is not preferred, but is somewhat plausible. So you'd say, well, if I, if I didn't know any better, I might think that this is what was going on. And I call that H naught, H null, H zero. Some people call it the ho, uh, even though this is zero, not a no. And then you pit them against each other with Hulk Hogan in bad graphics video game from the 90s. So you specify both hypotheses, and then you collect evidence. So you commit beforehand to which hypothesis is best. And you commit beforehand to some rules to decide which hypothesis wins this competition. You say, we'll collect evidence. And if the evidence goes this way, then the null hypothesis wins. If it goes this way, then the alternative hypothesis wins. You shake hands on it, you let people know before you even collect your data, and then you collect your data and see if you're right, or see if you are, your hypothesis is supported or not. So after you've collected the evidence, you don't just compare one to the other and say which is closest. <coughs> you do something else. You do everything all about the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis runs the show. You say, let's enter the world of the null hypothesis. If the null hypothesis is true, this is how the world should look. This is how the scores should be distributed. This should be their mean. This should be their standard deviation, etc. So we say, imagine if the null hypothesis were true. 
and then we say how likely is it that we would see our sample data, the data that we actually collected, that we clearly do see, or something more extreme, or something even more different from the null hypothesis. So I think of it as like a criminal justice type situation from a bad cop show. The cops are wondering, did Lenny rob the store? The null hypothesis is that he did not. The alternative hypothesis is that he did. The evidence is he has $25,000 in his briefcase. <coughs> so the cop might say to Lenny, I want to believe you. Let's say you didn't rob the store. But if that's the case, what are the odds that you would have $25,000 in your briefcase right now, right here, in this dark alley one block from a store? Right? If the odds are low, if most people don't have that going on when they didn't rob banks or rob stores, then you're more likely to believe that he did rob the store. You have more evidence to sway you into thinking maybe he did rob the store. But if the odds are high, if this is like Manhattan and plenty of people are walking around with $25,000 in their briefcase all the time, then Lenny would be like, actually, actually, those odds are quite high. I have five friends that regularly carry upwards of $20,000 in their briefcases. And then the cop will say, okay, then you're free to go. Nothing suspicious here. So this is the logic we use. So we could apply this to a variety of situations. So to further il illustrate this logic, wonder if a person that you're interested in loves you. The evidence, you got 15 text messages in the, from them in one day. So applying this logic, see if you can work it out for yourself or something that fits. The version that I worked out is something like null hypothesis, they don't love me. Alternative hypothesis, they do love me. And then the probability, the counterfactual probability question is something like, if this person didn't love me, what are the odds, what's the probability that they would send me 15 or more text messages in one day? Okay, so continuing this logic through another example, let's, let's just look at it with a confidence interval type testing situation. According to um, some researcher, action adventure TV shows nationally on average have 27.6 violent acts per hour with a standard deviation of 16.5. And Buffy the Vampire Slayer apparently has 59 acts per episode. Let's say this person has a hypothesis that Buffy is more violent than average, that is extremely violent. Um, so then you say, no hypothesis, Buffy is no more violent than average. Alternative hypothesis, Buffy is more violent than average. And so then you collect this data and you see 59. Well, is that a lot more? Maybe it's not much more. Well, we have a clue, the standard deviation, and we have the sample size, 50 episodes. So we can construct a confidence interval for the violence that we see in Buffy. From 50 episodes, um, the mean is 59, right here, and the sampling distribution of means is tall and skinny, unlike the original distribution here. And that gives us a confidence interval of 54.43 to 63.57. Well, the uh, null hypothesis value is 27.6. This is 54. That's the confidence interval. 27.6 is way down here. So that is not contained within there. So we have to say the evidence favors the uh, alternative hypothesis, unfortunately. Sad for Buffy. So let's um, skip past this. We already did the cage match business, and we have Lenny Robin in the store. So let's get another example. Is global warming happening? Let's not do any numbers with this. Let's just put together what the logic is. Um, let's say the evidence is that global temperature increase uh, of one degree in the 20th century on average. So what's the null hypothesis? What's the alternative hypothesis? What's your counterfactual probability question? The null hypothesis might be something like uh, global warming is not happening. That you know, any in apparent increase in temperature is just sort of random fluctuation by the fact that we happen to start sampling in the 20th century, that this kind of fluctuation is expected. The alternative hypothesis would be, no, no, this kind of fluctuation is um, unusual. And so we're in a period of unusual global warming or, or climate change or something. So the counterfactual question, which is critical, is to say, 
if global warming were not happening, if the null hypothesis is true and there's no global warming, how likely is it that through random sampling all the years of the Earth's existence or whatever, we would find an average increase over 100 years of 1 degree Celsius? So if there's no global warming, how likely is it that this would happen? So we don't say if there is global warming, how likely is it that would happen? There's a whole branch of statistics that does that, and they make fun of the rest of us. They're called Bayesians. They're based on the work of the Reverend Thomas Bayes from Enlightenment period England, who worked out some really funky mathematics. But we don't do that. We don't deal with the alternative hypothesis almost at all, except through confidence intervals. Confidence intervals are about the alternative hypothesis, and hypothesis testing is all about the null hypothesis. So here's another one. Does my advisor care about my education? The evidence, you've made 12 phone calls to this person with no reply. So come up with the null, the alternative, and the counterfactual probability question. So the null hypothesis might be something like, he does not care about my education. The alternative hypothesis might be, uh, he does care about my education. Now you can see I could have turned that around. I'll null, he does care. Alternative, he doesn't care. You could flip it any way you like. And often it's quite easy to flip these things around. But let's do it the first way I said. Then the counterfactual probability question is always, if the null hypothesis were true, how likely is it that we would see the results we saw or something even more extremely different from the null hypothesis um, suggested values? So, or expected values. So if he didn't doesn't care about my uh, education at all, then how likely is it that he would fail to re return 12 phone calls? Yeah, I'm going to guess that this one's pretty obvious. We don't need numbers on that one. 12 phone calls, that's a lot. So if the null hypothesis were true, this is the question we ask, what is the probability that our data would occur, our data or something more extreme? If there's a high probability that that would occur if the null hypothesis were true, well, then the null hypothesis is maybe the best explanation. I mean, high probability, null hypothesis, null hypothesis is true, high probability. These things go together. But, and then we, re we say we reject the alternative hypothesis, and we retain or fail to reject or accept the null hypothesis. We don't always say all those things, but that's what we do. We only say the part about the null hypothesis, um, optionally the other stuff. But if there's a low probability that our data would happen under the null, un, in the world of the null hypothesis, so in the world of the null hypothesis, it's unlikely that our data would happen, then we reject the null hypothesis, and we retain the alternative hypothesis, or we find support for the alternative hypothesis. We sometimes say that. This probability, high, low, in between, is called the p-value. p, imaginatively, stands for probability. More specifically, it stands for the probability that our data or something more extreme would occur if the null hypothesis were true. So how high is high? How low is low? Well, we have some arbitrary cutoffs. And you get to sort of pick. Almost always, those cutoffs are at three levels. 0 0.05, 0 0.01, and 0 0.001. Now note, to reject the null hypothesis and to retain the hypothesis that we are in love with and we want to sit in a tree and kiss and smooch all the time because we love it so much, then we have to have a low probability of the data being observed if the null hypothesis were true. In other words, a low p-value. So we need to be, so we decide before the study starts or before our test, we say is our, is our alpha level, in other words, the p-value to beat, is that going to be 0 0.05, 0 0.01, or 0 0.001. This is difficult to beat, this is less difficult to beat, and this is the least difficult to beat. So this is the kindest, and this is the most likely that you're going to beat this and actually say my study produced the results I expected. So we say alpha is 0 0.05, or alpha is 0 0.01, or alpha is 0 0.001, and then if P is less than alpha, we win. Hooray! We get federal grants, and our children don't have to go hungry, and ride their bikes 20 miles each way to their first jobs when they're nine years old. So which one we choose depends on how bad it is to be wrong or how good it is to be right. Sometimes we want to be very, very careful. Physicists tend to be extremely careful when they're trying to determine the nature of reality in the universe and make some announcement about that. They do something like 0.0001. It's, they call it uh, five sigma, six sigma, five sigma. It's five standard errors away from the mean. It's a ridiculously small number.
they're not going to say that we understand the way that some different thing about how subatomic particles work unless they're really, really sure. Most other sciences, we're not rearranging the nature of reality, so we're okay with being wrong a little bit more, so we'll say 0 0.05 or 0 0.01. So here's a nice XKCD comic about the null hypothesis. <laughs> So let's look at a few little details about confidence intervals versus null hypotheses. With confidence intervals, you don't actually have a stated hypothesis. With the null hypothesis, that whole process, you have two. The hypothetical sampling distribution of means, there's one in each of these, and they actually look identical, except they'll shift a little to the right or to the left. There's only one that really matters in the null hypothesis. There's theoretically maybe one for the alternative hypothesis, but we don't care. We just care about the null hypothesis sampling distribution of means. The center of those sampling distributions of means is very important. In confidence intervals, we center that over our sample mean. We say, what if our sample mean were the mean of the population? But in the null hypothesis, we don't care about that population. We care about this one that nobody likes, the null hypothesis. So we construct a sampling distribution of the mean around the null hypothesis mean value. In confidence intervals, we care about finding, say, the middle 95% or 90% or 99%. In null hypothesis testing, we're obsessed with the area in the tails. And then the outcome of a confidence interval is just our estimate of the confidence for where the true mean might be located. We say we think it might be located between these two numbers. Null hypothesis testing is very reductionistic. We just say yes or no. If p was less than al alpha, then we reject the null hypothesis. If it's greater than alpha, we don't reject the null hypothesis. We ch retain it or we fail to reject it. So here's kind of how the logic works. We get a sample mean and we say, what if this was a mean, or, or what if this was the mean of the entire population for a confidence interval? Then, okay, now it's the mean of a population then that's maybe what all the scores would be distributed as in the population. And the population has a certain standard deviation, which we magically know. Then this would be the distribution of all possible sample means from that population. Means with the same sample size as the sample I just happened to have done. And so now we have a mean of a sampling distribution of means. And the standard deviation of that sampling distribution is the standard error of the mean. It has a special name. And the middle whatever percent, 95%, for instance, is our confidence interval. And we figure out what those numbers of, th of the that middle percent, the cutoff numbers of the low and the, and the high end would be, and that's our confidence interval. And we say this is where we think the, the true mean is, and this is, and the width of this tells us how, how good or bad our estimate procedure is. The hypothesis testing is a little different. We say, here's our sample mean. And we say, what if our sample is just a fluke, something that happened in a very unpleasant, horrible world, where really what's going on is that the true mean is mu sub zero, is this null hypothesis thing. So really, what if the null hypothesis is true? And this is the distribution of all possible scores. And our sample mean came here. And this distribution has a certain standard deviation, etc. Then the distribution of all possible sample means, if the null hypothesis were true, looks like this. That's the sampling distribution of the mean for the null hypothesis. And then we say, what is the probability that we would obtain a sample mean as extreme as this one or more extremely different from the null hypothesis if the null hypothesis were true? And that probability is P. So it's the, it's the area under the null hypothesis sampling distribution of the mean curve. Now, frequently we're doing a two-tailed test. And so since we would have accepted something that was either a lot higher than the null hypothesis mean or lower than the null hypothesis mean, then we have to kind of hurt ourselves. And we have to divide our alpha area between both tails. We would have accepted it if it was over here, too. So we have to say, OK, also. This is P. So P is bigger, and therefore it's harder for us to reject the null hypothesis. So the difference between those two pieces of logic is something that you should get to know intimately. So in the null hypothesis test, it's different from a confidence interval in that 
confidence interval, the sampling distribution of the mean is based on our best estimate of where the true mean actually is. But in the null hypothesis test, the sampling distribution of the mean is based on the worst case scenario. It's the same size and shape and variance and everything as the confidence interval if we calculated it, or the sampling distribution of the mean if we were doing a confidence interval. It's just in a different place. All right, so let's stop there for right now.